not to waste time, but we're, we, we do have a little bit of time. We're going to set up a discussion, a panel discussion. So I'm going to invite um, all our speakers from this evening to join us. One of the things that I was thinking about during this discussion was <clears throat> this term that, that appeared in the 60s called the silent majority. And um, it was to represent the voiceless majority in the United States who were supposedly um, part of a surge of um, conservative people who were not opposed to the war, who were not uh, the Vietnam War, <clears throat> and who were um, in support of the government, and then so it, 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 when this, when I th was thinking about what does a silent majority mean, and I thought in reference to what we're working with here, I was thinking about the invisible majority or the invisible minority, other ways of thinking about our visual world, and um, these. Uh, debates that surface that sometimes we are completely unaware of when we as a tourist might arrive at one of these places and make our selfie picture and contently walk away not really realizing what we stepped into and and I think that uh, um, I'm, I'm a, a bit uh, uh, reacting to this idea of suspended uh, what what uh, Alessandro brought up is the suspended monument of uh, these camps living between uh, space and time and suspended space and time, or um, how we we are trying to understand um, these kinds of provocations. So I, I thought I would just start by asking a, um, a first question um, on... Um, how would we uh, be able to um, overcome uh, resistance in these public spaces? How can we uh, bring together people through the work we're doing? How do we uh, um, build uh, things to prevent prejudices from appearing, segregation, or uh, you know these kinds of uh, oppositions that we find uh, occurring in our public spaces more and more, and uh, I, like as you pointed out with the statue here in Lund, a statue which is a gathering place uh, for a far right wing group, um, which is not all that clear how you could counter that. You put a scarf on the the, the statue. Do you? You know, soften it up on the on the edges, or do you read counter poetry? So I mean, there's a there's a this the thing about visibility, invisibility, the suspension of time, um, or how these monuments suddenly are reactivated. So I would ask that question. Uh, maybe I should ask um, you, Joanna, about your practice, and um, it's it's a subtle issue about how you're moving through these spaces to make things happen. Yeah, I think one thing that I think is important is, you said something about prejudice appear. I think one problem is that uh, the spaces in which prejudice appear are often not spaces for debate. They are often uh, becoming black and white in media. And, um, uh, and so spaces that prejudice can appear and can be debated in a, in a non, um, in a less kind of uh, contested situation. Um, so doing things uh, in public space and uh, doing art, and, and since I have been like working a lot with we, me and myself and my team in, in the space, that has been a, a very good way. I mean, you have to be really, really prepared for debate. I mean, I actually in Malmö hired an extra person that could take this uh, with us. So using that 
being at the place and, and, and you doing things that could kind of externalize uh, discussions um, um, and could be like the place for debate um, in a smaller group within a process that then the prejudice appear and then I can debate them and I mean not so many times I can kind of convince a person uh, to a totally different standpoint, but we can, yeah, we can at least meet and debate. So that has been f important for me. And also, I mean, uh, I do that kind of spaces to, because I am curious and I'm, I, I, I don't want to be alone in my studio. This is a way for me to learn. So, yeah. It's kind of like overcoming that silence by, by uh, being there mm -hmm. and, and uh, engaging. Mm. The people around, yeah, because I'm trying to see how do you visualize that silent society that's within these public spaces uh, and whether or not, uh, yeah, you can transform something. I, I, I was thinking, Patrick, uh, what would your opinion be about how you engage and how you might work through? Well, I think it would tie into what Johanna just said, that it's a question of activating the spaces in a different manner. And um, whether that is, for example, what I talked about before as, a, as an option perhaps to, to engage with an existing um, monumental space in a very different way by adding new layers to it or by activating it through some kind of intervention that can be temporary or permanent. But I think that is th th there are probably lots of different strategies and what Johanna is describing here I think is a very useful one. It's a temporary one that perhaps might have consequences further on for the people who were there and participated in it. And there are you know, a broad specter of, of different types of engagement that could be, could be used. But activation of public space is crucial. Yeah, it's like you're trying to mirror what's going on. You're, yeah. you're trying to get some sort of like uh, <coughs> reflection of, 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 of what's, what, what is, I guess, a collective conscious, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. At Halbox. Yeah, and um, uh, Alessandro, is there any way to, but you have been doing this for some time by actually living in these spaces. Would, would you say that's a way of visualizing the invisible or unsuspending the suspended? Um, I was more thinking about maybe also a way that to challenge also our own conversation that the battle over public space will be ugly and um, and I think we have this tendency to think that public space you know it's then is about consensus is to be nice I think from what we already are witnessing and from what will be happen more and more in the future uh, that is actually at the center of a political struggle, you know, from in many ways, from um, people wanting to undermine maybe what um, um, what has been always conceived as a public space, or also not accepting, for example, there are different ways to use or to understand the collectivity, which is not necessarily associated to the idea of a public space, because ultimately the public is associated to the state. So different cultures organize collective spaces beyond the state. Um, and that is extremely challenging, for example, in, the cost, in, you know, in a context like Sweden, for example, in which maybe if one thinks about public is, is always associated with a kind of more abstract entity that should take care of cleaning and doing things because you pay taxes and all of that. But there are you know, many incredible other ways to think about collective spaces. And I think there, there is an incredible uh, battle, but also some hope if we manage this conflict, because it's going to be a conflict, and I think it's already a conflict. It's pretty evident, you know, because uh, more and more there are also suggestions from uh, friends architects to, to put like plans and to defend the public space, you know, that is the ultimate des act of desperation to defend something that is, that is um, challenged, you know, in that kind of way. And if we don't find 
other ways to tackle these fundamental issues, you know, in, in which how uh, this more complex society can have multiple understanding of what, how you constitute the collective that are not necessarily what is projected top down as a kind of more uh, biopolitical project. Um, if we imagine more and learn from maybe also unexpected places, and this is to me what was interesting working refugee camps because you know they managed to reopen up what I understood was a different way of understanding collective spaces. You know, at university, when you study architecture, there is, you know, this private, and then there is the public, and the public is always good. You know, if you work for the public, for the collective, it's always good. You learn that in non-European countries, the public was always associated with uh, occupation, was associated with colonialism. So if there is a suspect, you know, people are uh, very suspicious about the public because also they had different experience. And I think if we don't also understand that, it will be very difficult to imagine um, how to reopen up a form of collectivity that is not stuck only into the idea of a public and only into the idea of a nation state. So, um, and this is also where we can also locate our practice in places where we are, can reopen up a different understanding of collectivity. Right, I see that you, Johanna, uh, Gustafsson, first is, is you, 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 you had a, or no, I, you were just wanted to jump in or not? Uh, because I had a question on this topic. Um, yeah, with, you mentioned that the, the, the kind of male dominance of the discourse in the public space in Malmo, which mm. is mm. not just, of course, there, but it seems to be rampant. So, um, you know, you pointed out, how do you make it visible? Well, um, I mean, um, I work, uh, for example, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in this um, uh, neighborhood called Rosengård. Um, and we've been working a lot with the space outside the Rosengård center, uh, because the outdoor environments around that space is really, really neglected. Um, and one problem with that space is that it's very male dominated. Um, so it's more or less only male actually hanging out. Of course, there's women moving like in different directions, but there's, they're, they're always going somewhere. Uh, but the people actually hanging out there is men. Um, so we've been working with this space for quite some time now. Um, uh, and we have been working in the beginning with a temporary structure uh, and we have been working in close collaboration with different local actors and with the community uh, to sort of reappropriate that space. Um, and we have actually managed to have women and kids using this space now. Uh, and now it's also being redesigned to a permanent design uh, where we will also continue working with the community and the local actors to kind of make sure that this space is not yet again appropriated only by men. So I think it's something you have to constantly work with. So it's an, it's a, it's an act of occupation, yeah. counter-occupation. So that would be like the Hungarian memorial where you, it, it effectively was engaged immediately and, and not left in, in, you know, just forgotten or made invisible. So you kind of, I, I, again, I'm beginning to see through this paradigm of the silent majority and silent minority, that these, it's visually um, also uh, problematic if we're not engaging uh, directly, uh, we allow those things to remain invisible. So, but uh, then I was thinking about in your, uh, in, 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 you're also working in Malmo, that you were able to express, Joanna, uh, this, this kind of like express yourself while you were in the space, but w when you retreated from the space, it still continued, no? But was there any idea on your part, um, like we had uh, we talked about this, like the regrets of, w was that something you would have wanted to see continue or what? Yeah. I, I just want to first answer to 
uh, what you said and also a bit what you said because I think I did not say that we need to activate public space because uh, activity is also a way to colonize and this activity mm. in uh, spaces <laughs> Uh, not only squares and other spaces is also something that is used to kind of raise them. So I, I, I didn't mean no, activity no, I in just that sense. Uh, uh, clarify that, yeah, yeah. that that could also be. Um, so um, in in case of white pillars, uh, I think it worked very well when we did the building and it worked very well when it was alone uh, for a time but i think i i regret that i i kind of let go of them because when i once i decided that no i will i will not use them as like signals for i just want them to leave the, the square alone not to activate but then then i just i i i like let it go too much i should have kind of Mm, used the activity um, that they did, and I also know that uh, teachers in the area started to work with them, and they they, they did pillars ho at the school, so the kids could use and this kind of. But I should have kind of used this kind of non-activity <laughs> that created an activity, and kind of used it as an argument. I, w I should have pushed a bit more, uh, not as art, but as more kind of an argument in politics. I just, you know, let them go. But what you said that was really very interesting was that it was, it, you know, the, the suspicion was it was part of a surveillance system. Mm. And it's mm. so incredible that we, you know, from the Google car going around the, in circles with its, you know, 55 little cameras uh, recording our spaces, to this idea that almost no place we go mm. is unsurveilled. I, th I think that suddenly you, you, you kind of like taking it inside out and allowing people to, to put their own images onto something. So that was seemed to me very interesting that, that um, uh, maybe it's performative, if not um, occupational, because that's the tricky word here. But then... <laughs> Then, that would, then I would put that question the same to you. What about regrets about your project, Alessandro? Uh, were you encountering resistance over this idea of concretizing uh, counter-occupation? I have so many regrets that maybe I was also wondering that if it is the time to open for questions. Ah. Because, you know, otherwise I... <laughs> That's a big Yeah, I can regret. talk forever yeah. about regrets, so... That's actually an excellent... Maybe it, it is a way to conclude before it gets too tired. Maybe. Yes, yes, before we all drop yeah. it. <laughs> okay, can... Would anybody... If there are any... And know. do we have a microphone that we might be able to go around with? Maybe or? not. Yes. Ah, okay, we see a question. All right, I'll see if I don't trip over... <laughs> Something here. Thank you. Uh, this question is more for Johanna, but everybody, of course, uh, because you, you were talking, Johanna, about this intervention in this in uh, the Rosengård, yeah, and uh, occupying this male space that is mm -hmm. peripheral, and that in that case, I read about this as well, so um, I. I thought about it uh, in terms of how to translate that to the symbolic male space. So when monuments, th these statues, these monuments, mm -hmm. how do we intervene there? Because when a space is actively sort of occupied by just men hanging out, and there's this, you know, obviously the, the uh, danger, this question of, you know, being raped and all of that, the, the, being a, constructing a safe space maybe is the, the main issue there. But what about the past? How do we rewrite maybe the... Mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah. Um, um, <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not sure uh, the design of this space now, that it's actually in any way speaks a language that says uh, this is a space only for women. Uh, but rather we've been working with how do we actually get someone else to appropriate this space than uh, uh, 
uh, than men. Uh, and of course, because this is actually being rebuilt right now, um, so we're not li really sure how it's going to end. Uh, but last summer, we did uh, uh, a few temporary installations uh, we did some furniture and because before we started working here actually everyone told us it's impossible to do anything there it's going to get burned down it's going to get destroyed it's going to burn in three hours everyone told us uh, and actually this land is not owned by the it's not the public land it's owned by a private uh, landlord so if we wanted to do anything there we needed the landlord's uh, agreement uh, and of course the first small scale interventions we did was a test and it was a way of showing uh, this owner that this space had a huge potential uh, and if we just worked hard uh, we could transform this space from now a male dominated space with no furniture or anything uh, to a space where actually also kids and women could hang out uh, because everyone actually told us the only people that's going to use for example, this furniture we did is going to be men and they're going to sit there and smoke and they're going to scare off all the women and children. Uh, in the end, we proved them completely wrong. Uh, but it takes a lot of work. And I think that's also important to mention that the architect's respons responsibility doesn't really stop when the design is done. Yeah, uh. yeah for sure. Yeah. Anybody else want to take on? Okay, then any other uh, questions? Okay, um, just one sec. Thank you. Hi, um, very interesting panel and such an interesting conversation. Um, I'm Dana Plays, I'm a filmmaker here. And um, <clears throat> just to respond, it's interesting to think about, uh, just for example, the, the Vietnam uh, Memorial and the conversation between the figurative and the minimalist wall. I mean, part of this is, an aesthetic conversation where you have two two things. One would be perhaps the honorism, the honor um, <clears throat> versus what people would perceive was not an honorable uh, wall, but the design of the wall was really in terms of minimalist. Uh, how do we educate the public for one thing is the question to understand these aesthetics uh, so, that, so that these questions of figurative versus minimalism would be understood. Um, and, not, and so that on the one hand, that might be, you know, that they had to, to put that statue there to balance out the honor, but maybe it was just that people don't understand minimalism. Okay, so then we have this whole thing about these monuments and the way that they look, uh, perhaps these phallic, um, you know, kinds of structures. Um, so, so some of it is just on an aesthetic level versus, but I, I see the political implications of all of it. So anyway, my question is, how do, we, how do we move the whole conversation forward so that people understand and it evolves to another level in the future? Yes. I don't know about moving the conversation forward, but I, I would say that in this particular case of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and also a few other examples, it didn't take that long for the public to embrace Maya Lin's memorial. And it is very well loved today. So it was a question of giving it some time. I didn't go into any detail about the actual look of the memorial, but the reflective surface is truly important. It's engaging, it's an interactive surface in a way because you see yourself reflected among the names of the people who died in this war. So it, it is extremely loved. Um, the um, other thing I was thinking about is just a short statement. I think aesthetics is always ideological in a sense. It's difficult to, to disentangle aesthetics from ideology, especially when it comes to, to this kind of expression, monumental expressions. Um, in terms of educating the public, I don't know. It's a difficult question. There's this kind of spontaneity that rises up every time there is some kind of tragic event. And I can think of anything from the recent uh, uh, problem, well, the, the thing in Stockholm 
with the with a truck running down the street to any of these more recent tragedies that we're reading about in the headlines, there's a spontane spontaneity of reaction where you see all of these flowers and post-its and um, teddy bears and little signages and almost the entire community, very mixed, as I saw in Stockholm, coming up to express their solidarity with, with the victims. And at the same time, once that seems to disperse and um, a little more time goes by, then people start to think, well, what's going to be the more permanent um, recognition of such an event? And that's where we're always getting into problems because that's when this expression still needs to come from the community. <laughs> And I think that that's where we're having a greater problems tapping in. I think it's interesting in terms of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial that people continuously place these kinds of objects along the walls. So you have a permanent memorial, but at the same time you have um, a temporary memorial that's alive. And uh, whoever manages the Vietnam Veterans Memorial also takes care of all these objects. They are saved, they're not thrown out. Mm -hmm. So there is an archive of, of, of objects placed here. Right. I'd say we're running close to out of time, but if there's one last question, does anybody... Uh... Well, then, um, and no other comments from our... Yes, please. Yeah, I just want to say something. First, one thing that to like something is not always the best thing. Um, I mean, the conflict is also could be kind of the best result of an artwork. And I also think that this uh, spending a lot of time arguing about artwork and aesthetics in, pub in public life, in terms of what you were uh, talking about, Alessandra, that is also a signage of a kind of well-functioning society. Mm. Um, just a comment on that. Well, um, I'm always hoping that there's hope and that we will we will manage to get there one way or the other, but certainly the education is a two-way thing. We have to also figure out. Okay, well, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to the audience and to the Schizophrenia Museum. <laughs> <laughs>